Excellent. All right, here we go. So it is my pleasure to introduce um, Matthew R. Halley, who is an ornithologist and historian from Chester County, Pennsylvania, and is also the assistant curator of birds at the Delaware Museum of Nature and Science and a research associate at the Academy, sorry, I'm out of breath when I talk to the room, um, at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, where he earned his doctorate in 2021. He has extensive field experience in the United States and abroad, especially in the neotropics, and has authored dozens of research papers about bird evolution and the history of American science. During the last decade, Halley relocated and exposed a litany of overlooked primary sources, which have reshaped our understanding of historical figures like Wilson and Audubon, and the development of scientific ornithology in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Matthew. That's doing the correct thing. Give me one second, Matthew, and this will be your show to take away. Okay, and the bar is not up there, so I think we are good to go. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a long presentation with your with respect. Uh, does anyone object to me taking off my mask during the talk? No, I think it will make things a little easier to understand. Uh, you'll hear all the treble. Remember those old peanuts commercials? What? <laughs> uh, welcome to this morning's talk. Uh, this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, I've been working on. There we go. I've been working on. Oh, things aren't moving. Uh, I'm paralyzed. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now it's good. Everything okay. is good? Yep. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some original research that I've been doing for the last 13 years, give or take. Um, I'm also going to be synthesizing some information that's already out there about Wilson and about the origins of American ornithology and uh, ornithology in the United States. For the last 13 years, I've been doing an intensive research study in museums and archives, primarily in the Philadelphia region, which is where American, ornith uh, American ornithology began, you might say. Mark Catesby, yeah, he did travel from the South, South Carolina and Georgia uh, briefly in the 1720s uh, and published a book in England in the 1730s uh, with some of the American fauna. Uh, but I'm going to be telling you about the, the history of Philadelphia ornithology. And in particular, uh, I've been searching for unknown and overlooked primary sources. So going into archives, manually searching through boxes, folder by folder, and looking at what, did, what do I find and putting all the pieces together. My research has been primarily focused on what we call the early Republic period, uh, which extends from 1780, usually to about 1830. Uh, I take a more extensive approach on that time period. I take it to 1850 uh, so that I can cover the entire life of Audubon. I've done a lot of research on Audubon and you may have encountered some of my research. Um, Audubon was a complicated, troubled figure um, to say the least. Today, I'm not gonna be talking about Audubon. I'm going to be talking mostly about ornithology before Wilson in the United States and in the American colonies before uh, before the revolution. And then also the life of Wilson and put, help us put this man into perspective. As well, I'm interested in what happened, when, uh, who was involved, uh, the kind of facts of history. But I'm also really interested in historiography. How do historians interpret the facts? Uh, how does our bias shape uh, our interpretation of what happened in the past? And what standards of evidence do we use to, uh, to assess historical trends, the, the legacies of historical figures, uh, et cetera? I, I'm a scientist first. And as a scientist, I apply a, a uh, scientific empirical standard of evidence. Uh, and so after I do my research, uh, what often happens is empirical revisionism. 
Uh, revisionist history is a dirty word among historians, uh, but among scientists, we just call that the scientific method. Alexander Wilson, today we're tasked with pondering a couple questions. What does this man mean to the Wilson Ornithological Society and to its members? And how should we celebrate him going forward? This, these questions are subjective. Every person in the room is going to come to a different conclusion about this man, about the community in which he lived. And this is why we put together this workshop today to, to bring uh, the diversity of perspectives of everyone in the room to bear on this namesake that we're all carrying forward. So when you wear a t-shirt that says Wilson Ornithological Society, you're, you're, you're wearing that man's name on your chest. Uh, so I think we ought to know a little bit about him and be able to articulate a little bit about his history because it's our history. First, we need to address some really basic questions. Who was this guy? What did he do? How do we know what he did? Um, a surface level look, uh, he was a poet. He was born in Scotland and he immigrated to the United States in 1794. And he was a school teacher and a weaver. And he settled in Philadelphia. And around 1803, he began a project that turned into the first book about American birds that was totally devoted to American birds. He painted and drew hundreds of species and he wrote accounts and published a nine volume set uh, from 1808 to 1814, actually that's a typo. Uh, and he tragically died at the age of 47 years old in August, 1813. And the final two volumes of his book were published posthumously. Wilson, the, except for his signature on his will, the last words that we have from Wilson were a list of bird species he had yet to draw. This man literally worked himself to death. Um, it didn't take long after that uh, for folks to start calling Mr. Wilson the father of American ornithology. The first appearance of this phrase, to my knowledge, is in the 1820 Letters of Hibernicus, which was a, a pseudonym for the New York statesman DeWitt Clinton. Clinton wrote, Wilson, the father of American ornithology, was almost always a pedestrian traveler. In the decades after DeWitt Clinton used this phrase, it started to appear a lot in the literature. Father of American ornithology, father of American ornithology, father of American ornithology. Uh, if you repeat something many, many times, it continues to get cited. And, and uh, this was part of uh, the legacy of this guy and how, how we've come to know him today as the father of American ornithology. So this didn't all happen in a vacuum. Uh, in the 1840s, there was a, a theory that emerged called great man theory. Uh, Thomas Carlyle wrote uh, that the great man theory suggested that most historical change, most changes in our society are driven by great men with innate qualities. And it's those innate qualities that transform the society, not the other way around. All things that we see standing accomplished in the world are properly the outer material result, the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great men sent into the world. Now, Wilson was undoubtedly great. He published the first books devoted to American birds. He published the first descriptions of more than 20 bird species in North America. He was a charming poet an accurate observer of bird behavior and bird morphology. And this guy had legendary grit. And so by all accounts, Wilson seems like the model figure for this great man theory. And 200 years later, we're still calling him the father of American ornithology. Uh, in the, the consensus as of a decade ago, Wilson was unquestionably the first American ornithologist uh, two former presidents of our society penned this book, the Scott who founded American Ornithology and the late Jed Burt uh, also wrote several essays in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology. Uh, Philadelphia was the birthplace of American Ornithology. Alexander Wilson was the father. 
notice here that the, uh, the, the focus on the innate qualities of Wilson as this great man, uh, not the place where he came, Philadelphia. That was just the place Wilson had those qualities. He was the father, right? So there's another way to look at history, and that's from below. Uh, this idea suggests that great men are merely the product of their social environment. You must admit that the genesis of a great man depends on a long series of complex influences. Before he can remake his society, his society must make him. Now, interestingly, the second appearance of the phrase Father of American Ornithology came from Wilson's friend, George Ord, who edited the final two volumes of American Ornithology. Ord used the phrase Father of American Ornithology in this second sense, the history from below sense. He wrote that after ages, Wilson shall look up to the Father of American Ornithology, God and bless that providence which by inscrutable ways led him to the only spot perhaps of the civilized earth where his extraordinary talents would be encouraged to develop themselves and his estimable qualities of heart would be duly appreciated. So today we're gonna to take a journey to colonial Philadelphia and we're gonna to start to talk about the community around Wilson so that we can start to put this great man into perspective to understand his ornithological legacy, his historical legacy, and our legacy as the Wilson Ornithological Society. The oldest primary source uh, for American ornithology that I've come across, except for Catesby, right? It comes from 1756. John Bartram, who was a botanist, uh, who set up a botanical garden uh, called Bartram's Garden, on the Schuylkill River in what's now Philadelphia. At that time, it was outside the city. And he talked about his 17-year-old son, Billy. Now this is, uh, John wrote on May 3rd, 1756 to his friend, Peter Collinson in London. Billy is much obliged to thee for his drawing paper. These are Quakers, they use the thee and thou. He hath drawn many rare birds in order to send to thee and dried ye birds to send to his friend Edwards. He spent all his time this spring in shooting and drawing of rare birds of quick passage, which stay with us but a few days to rest and fill their bellies on their flight northward where they breed, as he observed by the females having immature eggs in their bellies. So young 17-year-old William Bartram in 1756 collected the type specimens of 14 species at Bartram's Garden in Philadelphia, and he sent those species to George Edwards in London. Edwards were published illustrations and descriptions of these species in Gleanings of Natural History in 1760. And then in 1766, when Linnaeus uh, applied Linnaean binomial names to these species, he based his descriptions on Edwards' descriptions of, of Bartram specimens. So Bartram, so the type locality for 14 species of American birds is Bartram's Garden in Philadelphia going back to the 1750s. Um, this is William Bartram on the left as an elderly fellow. Unfortunately, we don't have any picture of him when he was 17, uh, collecting the, the birds of passage at Bartram's garden. He became, uh, William Bartram became famous for uh, writing this book called, we shortened the title to Travels in 1791, uh, which contained the first description of the black vulture, uh, many, many other amazing ornithological anecdotes and a list of bird species with Latin, with uh, Bartram sometimes used trinomials. He was ahead of his time, uh, so much that the, that the uh, ICZN has suppressed all of his Latin names. So Bartram's specimens didn't survive because he was using what we now would call inferior taxidermy methods. And they were devoured by insects probably shortly after they arrived in Europe, uh, after they were illustrated by Edwards. Around the same time, in 1782, Thomas Jefferson started collecting bird specimens. Jefferson's been known for a long time for publishing a list of birds in his Notes on the State of Virginia, published in France in 1784, uh, which collated the Latin names of uh, Linnaeus and the names in Catesby and the names in the Comte du Buffon uh, 
Comte de Buffon's volumes from Paris. Um, but until I did some, uh, some digging, I went through Jefferson's unpublished memoranda and letters, and I found his uh, unpublished ornithology papers. So Jefferson was actually indeed collecting bird specimens. Uh, what you see on the left is a data form that was created before Jefferson went into the field, and then he was collecting birds in the field, and he filled in certain fields in the data form. You can see Mr. Thomas Jefferson written across the center. Uh, and on the right is a draft of a new species description for what he called Paris Flavus, the yellow titmouse, which uh, in his morphological description matches the eastern subspecies of palm warbler before Gemellan named palm warbler palmarum. So uh, had Jefferson followed through and published this description in his book, uh, he would hold, Jefferson would hold priority for the discovery of the palm warbler. Again, Jefferson was using W. Hornsby's method of preserving birds, which was basically stuff them with salt and some black pepper. Uh, that's beetle food. <laughs> so Jefferson's specimens didn't survive either. Really, in order for systematic ornithology to get off the ground, specimens needed to be stable so that we could come back decades later and if someone claimed I found a new species, be like, oh, well, did you compare it to the type specimens, right? We take this for granted now because we have type specimens that are centuries old. Uh, but in that time, uh, that wasn't the case. And so we have another man to thank for this technological breakthrough. And that's Charles Wilson Peel. For the rest of the talk, we're going to hear a lot about the Peels, uh, Charles and his family. Peel was a soldier in the Continental Army, fought under George Washington with valor, and rose to the rank of captain by the end of the war. During the war, he began painting portraits of the generals uh, and other notable figures in America at the time. George Washington sat for Peel seven times. The fact that we know what George Washington looked like is thanks to Peel. Um, he was a pioneer ornithologist, as I'm about to tell you today, and he was a pioneer taxidermist. He was a family man. Peel had 16 children by two wives. And as you'll see, his children played a critical role in the development of American ornithology. He was also a hoarder. Peel started collecting all sorts of natural curiosities. And in 1786, he announced in the newspaper in Philadelphia, uh, Mr. Peel, ever desirous to please and entertain the public, will make part of his house a repository for natural curiosities. He has acquired the means of preserving birds and animals in their natural form. And he intends to place his collection of curiosities, every curious species of birds and animals that he is able to obtain belonging to North and South America. This guy was ambitious. And it makes you wonder what his wife, Rachel, thought about turning the house into a taxidermy uh, museum. Uh, by the end of that year, Peel wrote, I have nearly completed the class of wild ducks belonging to this Delaware River, ducks and drakes, which I disposed in various attitudes on an artificial pond. Some birds and beasts on trees and some birds are suspended as flying. Um, so at that time, he was preserving his specimens with a concoction he called antiseptic powder, uh, which was, it was just spices. <laughs> it's the same thing Jefferson was doing with a new rebranded name. Uh, and he wrote, a, there's an unpublished memorandum uh, where he wrote his directions for preserving birds. He put, he, he uh, encouraged his children to put some of the powders in the skull where the brains and eyes were, also on all the inner parts of the skin, taking care to push as much of the powder as you can get into the pinions by the help of wire and stuff the skin with oakum. Oakum was fiber that was infused with tar. It was used in the shipyards, it was very rigid in structure and better for stuffing large birds because it helped those birds maintain their form. Uh, a couple of years later, Peel had another innovation, and this was the really important one. He dissolved powdered arsenic into a hot bath of water and then dipped his specimens into it. I began and continued my labor this whole day in washing my birds and beasts in the arsenic water. 
having my hands continually wet, I find a considerable soreness at the ends of my fingers. So much that I had a small fever at night and some restlessness. Peel put his body on the line for American ornithology. Now, like I said, Peel was a family man whose children played a really important role in the development of his science. Raphael, you're going to notice the other thing is that all of Peel's children were named after Renaissance painters. Uh, Raphael became a prolific collector and helped uh, assemble the Peel Museum. He was the eldest son. Rembrandt uh, was the proprietor of the Boston, the Peel Museum in Baltimore, rather, not Boston, uh, in Baltimore, which is the first building uh, constructed to be a natural history museum in the United States. Titian Peel, the first, uh, was also a prolific collector. And according to his father's letters to colleagues, Titian was an excellent taxidermist. You'll notice that Titian died in 1798 at the age of 18. Uh, this is Titian Peel the first. We'll learn about Titian Peel the second in a little bit. Rubens Peel became the manager of the Philadelphia Museum, uh, and Rubens was uh, the, he was the point person for the museum, the person who Wilson corresponded with and who Wilson interacted with when he was depositing specimens. And finally, we have Sophonisba. Sophie Peel was the first female American ornithologist. And we can't forget about Moses Williams. Moses was, uh, was born between, uh, just after Raphael, one of the oldest boys in the house. And he was born into slavery in Peel's house. In, after the war, uh, Moses was born in 1777, which was an inauspicious year in the history of the revolution. This is when General Howe captured Philadelphia and all, uh, you know, the revolution wasn't gonna succeed, right? Uh, it was sort of the breaking point uh, that, um, after the war, Peel had a change of heart and he emancipated Moses' parents. But according to Commonwealth law at the time, the, the son of the emancipated slaves was re required to remain in Peel's service uh, until the age of 27. And uh, with paid labor, uh, no longer enslaved, uh, but Moses was a, you know, an indentured servant, you may say, in Peel's household until the age of 27. He learned taxidermy. He did not learn painting, although all the Peel's children were trained in painting by Peel himself and sat with extra easels when their father was painting George Washington. Uh, Moses wasn't involved because it was seen as uh, you know, unfit for an African-American youth to be painting. I don't have any primary sources tying Moses Williams specifically to preparing birds, but this young man was grew up in the Peel household help working in the museum, preparing specimens and learning the taxidermy techniques. So I think we have a, a strong case uh, that this man was the first African-American ornithologist. Later, Moses became a cutter of profiles. He used the physiognotrace, which is an ingenious invention uh, that was installed in 1802 in the museum that would cut the profiles of people's face by, by passing a bar and then drawing it with a stylus in miniature. Um, and you'll see some profiles in a little bit. So by 1792, Peel and all of his children were collecting specimens and preparing these specimens. They had a lot of specimens. And so they started to use their American specimens, the duplicates, as currency for foreign exchange. The Peels didn't have a lot of space in their house, so they weren't going to mount multiple individuals of every species. So they're just trying to, it, it was like Pokemon, right? Collect, try to collect them all and try to get as many different species as possible with one or two specimens, uh, especially for the sexually dimorphic species you want to represent. The, the, and, and of course, they would, if they got some leucistic birds or something, they would mount those two because they were curious. Um, Peel wrote to his friend Thomas Hall in London in, in 1792, I therefore make you the proposal of sending you all the variety of this country for an equal number of European species that I may be prepared for such an exchange. I am now using every means in my power to collect and preserve the birds of the present season. I find that every year I discover some kinds that I had not known before. And from what I've read, I find that those who have attempted the natural history of this country were generally deficient of intelligence. Peel had a lot of undescribed species in his collection. 
Uh, he wrote, I have embraced the first coming of the birds this season and daily with one of my sons hunt and preserve all that we can. We have already mounted a tolerable number of the small birds in a handsome condition. And by constantly shooting them and ourselves, we, uh, them ourselves, we are able to gain a knowledge of their manners. In our thick forests, I find birds that perhaps are never seen on the cleared fields. And every succeeding year, our country furnishes me with some new species which I had not before. I mean to be attentive to preserve not only each species I can procure, but all its varieties, which in proportion to my success therein, much entertainment will be given to the inquisitive mind. When I print that part of my catalog, which describes the birds, it is my intention to give some etchings of those which I find had not been described. These plates I will execute myself because I expect that at least I will be more correct than if done by such engravers as this country affords. In 1790, Rachel Brewer, Peel's wife, passed away and Peel shortly thereafter remarried Elizabeth de Peister and began a second family. Uh, it was all the same family, but just a whole lot more kids. Um, 1794 was a big year for the Peels. This was the year that they moved the museum out of the house and into a public space for the first time. And they moved the museum into Philosophical Hall, which was only five years old at that point. It, it had been funded by Ben Franklin to house the American Philosophical Society. And Philosophical Hall then was used for the next 150 years as the seat of the American Philosophical Society, uh, where the meetings were held. And that same year, Charles Linnaeus Peale was born. This was the first child with uh, Peale's second wife, uh, Elizabeth. And if there was ever any doubt that Charles Wilson Peel was a devotee of the Linnaean system, he named his own kid Linnaeus. The first Linnaeus, perhaps so named in America, was born this morning. May he be a light to this new world like him of Sweden, whose persevering labors in natural history hath illuminated the old world. A couple years later, Titian Ramsey Peel II was born in Philosophical Hall. He was named after his late brother who passed away the year before. This is the Titian Peel who you probably have heard of before. He became the most famous ornithologist in the Peel family. He accompanied Thomas Say on the long expedition to the Rocky Mountains in 1819. He was one of the chief naturalists on the US exploring expedition in the 1840s. Um, and uh, the uh, what is it, a storm petrel with the name Peelii? That's an eponym devoted to Titian Peel II. That same year that Titian was born, 1799, uh, Charles Wilson Peel kicked it up into high gear. He started delivering public ornithology lectures at Philosophical Hall, 27 unpublished lectures that were modeled on his friend John Latham's books, The General Synopsis of Birds. Latham's multiple volumes uh, published in London, uh, Peel created an American counterpart to Latham that uh, sadly just went unpublished and it's been uh, to this day, uh, has never been seen by anyone uh, until I came along and I transcribed it all. In the lectures, Peel follows the Linnaean system. He describes more than 600 species of birds. And the first transcripts are coming soon in Ornithology in Peel's Museum. For the last three years, I've been creating a digital inventory of every specimen known to have existed in Peel's collection, all based on primary sources, scoured all of the early American newspapers and diaries and letters in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and the American Philosophical Society Library and the Academy of Natural Sciences and the Library Company of Philadelphia. We've gone, we've gone through every, every known source and carefully compiled. This is just one component of a larger project called America's Earliest Museums, which I was editing the ornithological portion of this project, but the, the project in its entirety, we've created a digital inventory of every object known to have been in Peel's museum, thousands of objects. Later this year, a website will be launched that'll be hosted by the American Philosophical Society 
And so you'll be able to read Peel's ornithology lectures for yourself for the first time later this year. In 1802, Peel moved the museum next door. Thomas Jefferson had become president and the new national capital, Washington, DC was ready to go. And so for the first time in decades, the Pennsylvania State House, which is now known as Independence Hall was vacant and Peel saw an opportunity. So he rented space in the Peel in the uh, State House and moved the, what, be, what became known as the Philadelphia Museum. On the second floor of the State House is a long room and Peel lined the walls with his glass cases and filled the room with his taxidermy birds arranged according to the Linnaean system. That same year, Dr. Benjamin Smith Barton at the University of Pennsylvania approached Peel. Uh, Peel wrote, Dr. Barton got several of his friends to speak to me about having permission to explain to his class the characters of the subjects of my museum. 10 of his pupils have brought tickets, bought tickets. He expects his class will amount to 24. This was the first university led course in ornithology uh, offered for the University of Pennsylvania between 1802 and 1807. Uh, you'll notice that these dates, this is all before Wilson published a single word of ornithology. There were already university students in the museum learning about American birds and how those American birds were related to the birds of the world. Now, at the time when all of this activity was going on down in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Museum, across the what's now known as the city, right, which at that time was kind of out in the country on the other side of the Schuylkill River in what's now known as the neighborhood of King Sessing, Alexander Wilson moved to King Sessing and became a schoolmaster at a one-room schoolhouse called the Union School. Right down the road was Bartram's Garden, where, as we've already uh, discussed, William Bartram collected those type specimens back in the 1750s. By this point, Bartram is in his senior years, and he's a legend. Uh, he's widely known as the philosopher of King Sessing. And uh, his book Travels is a bestseller, uh, widely in his day was regarded as a great work of literature and it remains so today. So here we have in the same year, the spring of 1803, over in the city, we have the Philadelphia Museum and over in the country nearby, we have Wilson and Bartram uh, who have just come together, uh, this, this famous relationship that we've heard so much about. So May 31st, Charles writes, to his son, Safanisba is not only preserving birds well, but she also accompanies me in the hunting excursions and is now fond of shooting with the little fussy. This is a uh, shotgun. The very next day over in King Sessing, Alexander Wilson declares his intention to make a collection of all our finest birds. Rubens Peel was in Europe at the time in that spring of 1803 uh, with his brother Rembrandt and Charles and he were writing letters back and forth and Char uh, Rubens responded to Charles, it, it gives me pleasure to learn that Sufanisba has become a collector. I hope she may prosper in it for I hope to partake in that same pleasure when I return to dear Philadelphia. I should like to see foreign countries and collect in them, but in my situation can do but little. Charles responded, the museum will now in a short time have the catalog in frames over each box. Sufanisba has advanced so far that I have now taken out of the room the book catalog. That summer, the yellow fever returned to Philadelphia and the populace of Philadelphia fled into the countryside. Charles and Sufanisba stayed back. They stayed in Philadelphia through the pandemic and renovated the exhibits in the museum. And Sufanisba took it on herself to create these frames on the glass cases that, where she wrote the Latin binomial names and the English names and the French names of all the species so that the visitors to the museum uh, could see the Linnaean system displayed in front of them and wouldn't have to flip through a book. The Rubens came back to Philadelphia the following spring. And this is when Wilson first met the Peels. Reuben's daughter later re wrote this story in her diary. Um, 
that she wrote, Father Rubens was one day out shooting and sat down to eat his dinner when Mr. Wilson, then a young man teaching school, came by and looking at the birds, said that father had shot a favorite bird that often beguiled him in his leisure hour by its warblings. Wilson showed so much fondness for birds that Rubens invited him to visit the museum, to see his collection there, which he did. And from that time, Wilson devoted himself to the study of that branch of natural history and wrote a very celebrated work on ornithology. We know that Wilson visited the Peel Museum probably that very spring in 1804 after meeting Rubens because we have his silhouette. On the right side of the screen, you see Wilson's silhouette, which was traced by the physiognomy trace, probably executed by Moses Williams in the Philadelphia Museum. You'll notice that Wilson's silhouette is uh, rudimentary. Some of the details, uh, Williams's portrait on the left, you see even has an eyelash and some and little details around the, the collar that are missing in Wilson's. Uh, Wilson's silhouette seems kind of crude. And that's because the physiognomy trace was just installed in December of 1802. And Moses Williams was still learning how to use it. The same, that same year, after Safanisba finished her catalog in frames, uh, her father created a pamphlet called Guide to the Philadelphia Museum. So when Wilson visited the museum for the first time, we know what he saw. The Linnaean classification is generally adopted throughout the animal department. In the long room, Linnaeus's classification of birds with the characters of each order and genus is, for want of space to display it better, exhibited in a gilt frame at the entrance of the long room. All the birds are in glass cases, and inside the insides of which are painted to represent the appropriate scenery, mountains, plains, or waters, the birds being placed on branches or artificial rocks. These cases, rising 12 feet from the floor, extend the whole length of this room, which is 100 feet, producing an uncommonly elegant display. In frames over each case, the genus is first noted, then their species and names, in Latin, English, and French, referring to the numbers which are attached to each species. There are now in this collection, perhaps all the birds belonging to the middle, many of which likewise belong to the Northern and Southern states, and a considerable number from South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, New Holland, and the recently discovered islands of the South Seas, the number exceeds 760 species without the admission of any duplicates contained in 140 cases. This is what Wilson saw when he entered the Peel Museum for the first time. Shortly after that, he took a trip to Niagara Falls. This was the beginning of Wilson's ornithological career. Over the next four years, he took several important ornithological expeditions, first to Niagara, then to New England, then to the Southern United States, to Georgia. And in 1808, uh, th by this time, Wilson had, uh, he had some expertise and he had learned a lot of, from his journeys and all of his collecting, and he had struck up a friendship with Mr. Peel. Peel wrote to Jeffrey at the Paris Museum in 1808, a friend of mine, Mr. Alexander Wilson, is about to publish a work of the birds of North America, which will rectify many errors of authors on our birds, and he will also give plates of many that have not been noticed before. This gentleman is indefatigable in his researches to acquire a knowledge of the manners and habits of our birds. He has aided me considerably, for he is active with his gun at all seasons and correct in his observations. The first volume will shortly be put to the press. He means to comprise the work in two volumes. Dear sir, it gives me pleasure to introduce to your acquaintance a gentleman with the talents of Mr. Wilson. He is not only a poet and a faithful historian, but a man of great modesty possessing an indefatigable industry in whatever he undertakes. His love of natural history induces him to undertake an expensive and laborious task, that of giving a true portraiture of the American birds. Besides receiving from his many specimen, from him many specimens that I was not acquainted with, he has given me information of the manners of many others which the museum possessed. Indeed, he actually knows more of the American birds than any man I've yet been acquainted with. And I have no doubt that he will make a valuable work of his ornithology and that he will obtain a handsome list of subscribers to it. The numbers being already considerable for the time it's been before the public, Mr. Wilson can inform you of the progress of my museum. 
in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, <clears throat> among the Peel family papers is a large leather bound ledger. It's the accessions book for the Philadelphia Museum. And Wilson's donations to the museum are found in its pages. In 1808, the first ornithological do uh, deposit that Wilson made at the museum was 16 birds, nests, and eggs from Pennsylvania presented by Alex Alexander Wilson. In 1811, he deposited a female brown bittern, a female indigo bunting in the winter dress, nearly brown, presented by Alex Wilson. In 1812, Alexander Wilson sent two skins of the black hawk. Black hawk is the rough-legged hawk, black, the dark morph. And believe it or not, I found one of these specimens in the Academy collection where it had been overlooked for 200 years. Attached to the bird's leg is the original wooden pedestal upon which this bird was mounted in Peel's museum. And on the bottom of the pedestal written faintly in pencil, it reads Wilson's original variety of the black hawk from Peel's museum, JC. JC is of course, John Cassin, former curator of the Academy's collection. In 1812, Wilson deposited several specimens of hawks, nondescripts, and in 1813, his final deposit, eggs of the bald eagle from Egg Harbor, New Jersey. This is it. That's all of Wilson's deposits. There weren't, they were few and far between. The reason being is that Peel didn't have any space. If Wilson gave him anything else, it wasn't going in the museum. You saw that long room. They fit 790 species in there. Um, it's possible that Wilson collected some specimens and gave them to Peel, and then Peel used them as currency and sold them to Europe to get some, something better. Um, 1808, the first volume of American Ornithology is published. And Wilson uses the Linnaean binomial system, as we all know. Here he calls the blue jay Corvus cristatus. Below that, there's a list of synonyms. Uh, these are already published works where Wilson found that this species had already been described or depicted in some previous work and following standard, what's now standard taxonomic practice, gave the list of the synonyms. At the end of his list of synonyms, he wrote Peel's Museum, number 1290. Now there's a question, what does this mean? What is this number? Was this a number of Wilson's own specimen that was deposited with Peel? This is what most historians have assumed, that all the Peel numbers in Wilson's book were the numbers of Wilson's specimens that he gave to Peel. Or was this a specimen that was collected by Peel before Wilson and Wilson cited it to give Wilson credit or to give Peel credit? The same way he cited Linnaeus or Latham or Bartram to give these former uh, writers credit for the discoveries. One way that we can examine this question and try to figure out which of these two uh, situations we're dealing with is by looking at Wilson's new species, the species that we still today attribute to Wilson as the author. Let's start with the marsh wren, Cystothorus palustris, Wilson, 1811. Uh, Wilson, this appeared in volume two of American Ornithology. Certhia palustris, he used the Latin name. He cited Peel's museum. Well, Peel had already described the marsh wren in 1799 in his 36th lecture on natural history. How about the field sparrows, Phizella pusilla, Fringilla pusilla? Again, Wilson cited Peel's museum. Well, Peel had already described the light red billed sparrow. This is one of our smallest sparrows. We find them early in the spring, enlivening that charming season by their pleasing notes in his uh, 34th lecture, 1799. How about the song sparrow, Mellow Spies and Melodia, Wilson, 1810. Again, he cited Peel's museum. Well, Peel had already described the spotted breast sparrow in 1799 in his 34th lecture. How about the cerulean warbler, Satophica cerulea, Wilson, 1810. Again, he cited Peel's museum. He didn't cite anything else but Peel's Museum as a synonym. And, and notably, he said here, this delicate little species is now for the first time introduced to the public. Notice, except my friend, Mr. Peel, 
I know of no other naturalist who seems to have hitherto known of its existence. And indeed, in 1799, Mr. Peel had described the blue and white warbler, which he found in the vicinity of Philadelphia among the spring birds, rare. How about the magnolia warbler, Cetophaga magnolia, Wilson, 1811? Wilson cited Peel's Museum, 7789, and wrote that uh, this bird I first met with on the banks of the Little Miami. Uh, afterwards, I found it among the magnolias not far from Fort Adams on the Mississippi. Well, Peel had already described the black and yellow warbler in 1799 in his 36th lecture. Uh, of note, Wilson stated that the markings of the female are unknown. Peel had already described the female in 1799. How about Wilson's warbler, Cardolina Pusilla? Again, Wilson cites Peel's museum. And again, Peel had already described the green warbler in 1799 in his 36th lecture. How about the Eastern whippoorwill, Antrostomus vociferus, Wilson, 1812? cited Peel's Museum for the male and the female. Peel in his 39th lecture, 1799, had described the whippoorwill. How about the black-billed cuckoo? Cachysis erythrothalmus, Wilson, 1811. Again, Wilson cites the Peel Museum. As early as 1797, Peel had found a variety of the Carolina cuckoo. Only one kind was described in Catesby. I take such pains to know all our birds, and by dissecting each that I preserve will enable me to speak with certainty on the sexes of many of our birds. This I find particularly necessary as some authors have committed errors in their descriptions of them. How about the canvas back? Athea valicinaria, Wilson, 1814. Wilson cited Peel's museum. And in the 22nd lecture, 1799, Peel had already described the canvasback duck. There's a pattern emerging. How about Wilson's plover? This was described by Ord in 1814 in the final volume of American Ornithology, posthumously named it after the late author of the celebrated work. And Ord following Wilson's tradition cited Peel's museum. And again, Peel in 1799 had already described the little brown plover, which was like the kill deer, but the bill is thicker and shorter. So by the time Wilson first set foot in Peel's museum, Peel had already mounted and arranged over 80% of the species that would appear in Wilson's book. Here we see a diagram where North American species in Peel's Museum are shown on the y-axis is just the number of species, and it's a timeline on the x-axis. And you can see that this looks a lot like a species accumulation curve, right? And the slopes of the lines keep getting shallower as you go up. Uh, Peel, and so what this is, how I, so as I assembled my digital inventory of all the known species from Peel's museum, every species is attached to a primary source that confirms its presence in Peel's museum. The 247 of those species, the earliest known primary source comes from Peel. For 36, including all these new species that I just talked about, 36 of those species in the data set the earliest known primary source comes from Wilson. That's an overestimate. Probably a chunk of those, maybe as many as half, actually came from Peel. I just haven't found the sources yet. And then another 29% on the top there uh, are Bonaparte and Say and later workers in the Philadelphia Museum after Wilson's death. So was Wilson the father of American ornithology? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. No. <laughs> it's not even close. 
Was he the first to use the Linnaean system in America? No. Was he first in the hearts of his countrymen? Undoubtedly, yes. Here we are, the Wilson Ornithological Society. We publish the Wilson Journal of, Orn of Ornithology. We rotate four different covers. They're all the eponymous names applied to Wilson. There's no eponyms for Peel. There's no societies, no journals. And the truth is that Peel would have wanted it that way. Peel wrote, there is also another unmeaning custom, which it is still more essential for us to get rid of. <clears throat> I mean that of naming subjects of nature after persons who have plumed themselves with those childish ideas of their being the first discoverers of such and such things. If you thought that bird names for birds was a modern movement, you're wrong. It was the ancestral state of American ornithology. And so you must admit that the genesis of a great man depends on a long series of complex influences. Before he can remake his society, his society must make him. Before he can remake his society, his society must make him. We are the Wilson Ornithological Society, sitting here at the 104th annual meeting. And we're tasked with discussing what does Alexander Wilson mean to American ornithology, to our field, to our community, to each of our members. And we're also tasked with discussing how do we celebrate Wilson going forward in the light of history? Um, as scientists, we revise our hypotheses when new data emerge. And so today I'd like to you to consider this context when we're discussing these questions about Wilson, but what does he mean to us as a society? Um, and I don't have the answers other than bird names for birds, that's one answer. I don't have the answers. There's a plethora of opinions and perspectives on these, on these questions. Uh, so I'd say thank you for listening to the talk and we're gonna take a short break, I think for some uh, question and answers first and then the reflection. Okay, so I'd be happy to take any questions that we have about uh, anything really, um, whether I can answer them is another question. Oh. It was hard, but I but I did it. <laughs> I've been doing that for three years, tracking the museum. It's hard just because these are unpublished sources. They're in folders and libraries. Uh, as we, oh, it's un... the influence of Wilson is undoubted. Yeah. Um, Wilson's American Ornithology is a foundational work of our field, no doubt. Um, the what, who generated the content that went into those books is something that we're gonna be debating for many decades going forward as these new primary sources emerge. Um, 
but the influence of Wilson's work, you know, is undeniable. And, uh, and so the, sometimes we put great, these great men with this great man theory, we put people up on a pedestal and the pedestal looks so high. And that's only because we haven't told the stories of all the other individuals that were around that person. If we tell the stories of those people and we raise them on their respective pedestals, then suddenly the, the, the uh, degree to which Wilson stands above everyone else uh, is, comes back down to re uh, reality. So that's maybe how I would, I, I don't think we should be pulling down Wilson's front pedestal. I'm interested in building up the uh, community of people around him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, publishing is expensive. Peel was trying to publish. He just didn't have the money because of yellow fever. The pandemic hit and his museum went under. And for years, he struggled to get people to come through the door, to subscribe, to become members, to come see the specimens. He also lobbied the federal government and the state government of Pennsylvania. Sorry, I'm drifting from the microphone. Uh, he lobbied the government because Peel wanted his museum to become the nucleus of a national collection, which is what is now the Smithsonian. And the government was like, oh, no, 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 hemmed and hawed until Peel died and Peel's collection was dispersed and sold at a sheriff's sale and half of it burned in a fire. And then the government was like, you know, we, we really ought to start a national collection. Um, in a perfect world, the nucleus of the Smithsonian's collection would have been the Peel Museum collection. Um, unfortunately, now there are very few extant specimens from Peel's collection uh, that I've been able to trace. When I started, we had two of Wilson's type specimens. I found two more. So now we have four with provenance. There's a bunch of specimens up at Harvard that have dubious provenance. Um, and so they've been claimed to be this or that, the model for Wilson's paintings, but there's just no paper trail and there's no provenance. And there's a lot of stuff in that Boston Museum collection at Harvard that came from not, you know, other sources. Um, it's also important to remember that just because something was in the Peel Museum and Wilson painted that species, you know, after Wilson died, the Philadelphia Museum continued to build its collection until 1839. So there were later expeditions to the West. You know, the, the Lewis's woodpecker in the Peel Museum, the old, it wasn't just one that was brought back from Lewis and Clark. No, the long expedition went West, there, uh, right? Nuttall and, and Townsend went West in 1834. There were other specimens that were arriving to the East from the West. Um, so we can't just say it, at Harvard, oh, here's a Lewis's woodpecker. This must have been the one from Lewis and Clark. You know, it doesn't work that way. Um, like I said, this, this is the opening chapter of a new story. And we, I don't know all the details yet. We're still putting it together. Um, what I've shared with you today is just sort of the, uh, the sketch on a napkin, you might say, of how we go forward with this history. So the theme of Wilson, there was no deceit in his American ontology. He tried to feel, he probably assumed, well, yeah, I'm giving Peel a catalog. Exactly. Uh, is that your, is that your yeah, Peel, I'm, Peel loved Wilson. Peel would open up this book and be like, man, this Wilson guy's all right. He cited me on every page. Right? Wilson was in a position to be able to the work and Peel was not, and Wilson had the artistic yeah. ability. A writer in 18, 1810, I think, or 1808, right around the time when Wilson finally started publishing, Peel retired. He moved to, he got an estate up in Germantown and moved to the country, and Rubens took over the museum. And so when Wilson was bringing his skins of the Black Hawk, he was sending them to Rubens, not to Charles. 
Charles was, uh, you know, in his senior years out in the country. And probably Charles Peel probably thought that, man, I've really left this in great hands. Yeah. All this ornithology work, this guy Wilson respects me and is citing the work. And unfortunately, then we fast forward and the historians of the late 19th century and the historians of the 20th century, uh, they just misinterpreted the Peel numbers and assumed that the 255 Peel numbers or whatever the number is in Wilson's ornithology were all Wilson's specimens that he deposited and that all of that was his work, you know, and it wasn't. Oh, did you find any cases where the transcribed notes in the 20 lectures, the 20 lectures, where Wilson actually used the same verbiage? Uh, no, 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 I've, I haven't found any case. Uh, <laughs> I've got a sharp eye for BS and Wilson, there's not any BS in Wilson's book, um, you know, contrasted with Audubon and you, it's a, it is really stark difference. Um, from what I, I've never caught Wilson in a lie. Um, so there's that. And then the article or whatever that Peel had written, the numbers never before responded. Great, great question. Peel renumbered things multiple times. And I've been I've been uh, studying the Peel numbering system for a long time. First of all, it's not even clear that those numbers that Wilson cited are actually referring to specimens as much as species. And it was, and even what a species was back then was pretty up for debate. Uh, and there were multi, there was a French ornithologist, Palisot de Beauvoir, who visited the Philadelphia Museum in the 1790s and worked on writing this catalog. So he created a number system. And then when Peel did his lectures, he had a whole nother numbering system. And then about 1806, Peel changed the numbering system again. Um, so the numbers eventually changed them to the ones that Wilson uh, used. So the numbers you saw in the sources I showed you are the lecture numbers, which don't, which every lecture number has a corresponding number to the final Peel numbering system. Um, it's it it was confusing, and I've there are cases in the lectures where Peel changed his mind and he moved a he moved a species to a, a different genus. And then change uh, and then change the numbers. So the numbers weren't attached to the specimens permanently. They were just, you know, he moved the numbers around and and just a. So we come into this with our modern conception of how we catalog things in museums today. And it's not the same way they were cataloging things back then. So. Uh, Notwithstanding the pandemic, Paul, it seems weird to think about anyone who looks at the history. But, you know, who could look upon his uh, social life? And, you know, who else could develop a museum over a couple of months? But Wilson's background is anything like My question is, from your study, where did he get his back? Where did he get his money? Where did Peel get his money? Pardon? Peel? Or, or Wilson? Well, oh. Wilson. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Wilson was really poor, um, had very few belongings. We actually have like an inventory of his belongings um, from 1811 that he wrote. <clears throat> he, this was a subscription model and he made a deal with Samuel Bradford, who was a publisher in Philadelphia at the time um, and Bradford and Inskeep. And Bradford and Inskeep were also publishing a encyclopedia called Rees's Encyc Encyclopedia, uh, the American edition. Uh, this is the work that later Audubon plagiarized his Bird of Washington from. The Wilson was the editor of the Rees's Encyclopedia. So he was working as an editor. He worked as a schoolmaster. He worked as a weaver. He was, he was going from one job to the next, making ends meet. When he made the deal with Samuel Bradford, to make this work on ornithology, the first volume, it was like, this is a, an experiment we're gonna try. If you can get, if you can go around and get the subscribers and get people to, to pony up the money and say, hey, I'll subscribe for how many issues, uh, then we'll have enough money to go forward. 
he did the first the first volume and it was a success the so much of a success that wilson went on uh after his first volume was published he took his 1808 trip down to georgia when he came back they had already they had so many subscribers that they printed another 300 copies of volume one and we know that because in the account of the wood thrush wilson inserted one additional sentence about something that he had saw in georgia and so uh, we know that there were two different pressings of volume one so it was a pay to play kind of thing and the only uh and that subscriber model um you know it, it was very stressful for wilson and some later historians have suggested that that you know the publisher was really to blame for wilson's death not wilson not wilson you know not the dysentery uh it was the publisher who was pushing wilson so hard to get more subscribers to make this make this financially viable come on do it and wilson was under tremendous amount of stress and pushed himself to the limit and ultimately to his demise there was a fire at the American Museum in New York City in the 1860s. This is probably what you're referring to, um, where half of Peel's collection was destroyed. Um, so Peel's children, uh, despite their artistic and ornithological talent, uh, were not very talented with money and they were good at spending money they didn't have and by the end and by the end of the philadelphia museum's existence you know the they uh this was no longer going to be a viable business model to run a museum they sold all the materials half of it went to pt barnum of the barnum and bailey circus barnum took it to new york to his american museum and put it on display that burned down in 1865 uh, there was no inventory made of what Barnum had in that museum before it burned either. The other half went to Moses Kimball, who was associated with the Boston Natural History Society, who took it to the Boston Museum. Uh, that material ended up in Kimball's barn after the Boston Museum closed for like a couple decades. It was stored in a barn. Everything was deteriorating. Eventually, by like first uh, decade of the 20th century is when those materials were deposited at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, but by that time, all of the original mounts and whatever labels or data that had existed had, were all disassociated from the specimens. And all that was left were a bunch of, uh, the, the truth is that the folks up at Harvard didn't realize what they had and they, they sold some of that to a taxidermist. And then William Brewster realized it, and went to the taxidermist and was like, can you please give this back to us? We're sorry that we, and the taxidermist had removed a bunch of the data labels too. Uh, this is a kind of a, it's a story that hasn't really been well told yet. Um, I know about it from a, several primary sources, um, but that's, I think that's probably what you're alluding to uh, is the fire. There's been some other big fires, Swarthmore College collection burned down um, that may have had some remnants of the Peel collection and it's hard to say. Wilson was engaged to be married shortly before his death. Um, he never had any, was never married, never had any children. And his, his father was in Scotland and he would occasionally, and he had some cousins in, in America and he would ascend, occasionally send, uh, he actually, in his will, he gave two copies of American Ornithology to his father that were sent to Scotland. Yeah, he had a lot of kids. They collected a lot of birds, but that was a lot of mouths to feed. Yeah, Peel didn't couldn't afford to publish his book because he's got sixteen children. Uh, that was definitely part of it. You know, Titian Ramsey Peel II, who became such a famous ornithologist for years, asked his dad, "Dad, I want to work in the museum. Like, can you find the space for me?" And he's like, "Look, Rubens is already the manager. I can't hire more than one person right now. We just we just can't swing it." Um, Your thoughts about 
the relationship between Wilson and Steele. Mm -hmm. The timing is that yeah. he was in Philadelphia, but didn't get turned on to the election until a week before. Yep. And the elections have already happened. Well, the, lec uh, the lectures were, the lectures started in 1799. And then Peel continued to give these lectures annually, except for in 1803 when the yellow fever hit. So, but the second week. Yep. And also Barton was teaching his courses on ornithology in the museum. And I know for sure that Wilson knew about these lectures. Um, I was, how I got into all of this, I lived, I was the resident caretaker of a historic house in Philadelphia called the Wick House, which was the home of Reuben Haynes III. And uh, for nine generations, a single Quaker family lived in this house. And Reuben was the corresponding secretary of the Academy of Natural Sciences for 18 years. And when I lived in this, this is where I found uh, the lost letters of Audubon and a lot of the materials that sort of started this whole thing. Um, Reuben it was taking Barton's class. Reuben was one of the students in Barton's ornithology class in 1807. And he, we have his lecture notes. So I have Reuben's notes from class in his handwritten uh, Dr. Barton at the museum dated, uh, they're working on the uh, Gralli or, or the other going one order at a time. It's all arranged by Linnaeus' system. Uh, Reuben would go to class and then the next, and like a couple days later, there's a great story in Reuben's diary where Reuben, he says that he, he, he went to the uh, Pennsylvania hospital, I believe it was. He found a yellow bird against that had hit the glass in the greenhouse. And he picked up the bird and he put it in his hat and he carried it to Alexander Wilson's house. And he let the bird fly around the room so the kids could enjoy it. And, uh, and then they set it at liberty. Um, and then a few days later, Reuben's writing his notes again from ornithology class, right? So Reuben was friends with Wilson. Reuben had money and had a bunch of properties. And he even, I'm pretty sure he hired Reuben, hired Wilson to help prospect some of the properties. There's one diary entry where Reuben says, I, I called Alexander Wilson from his bath to go with Jim up to wherever. You know, or, or uh, you know, I borrowed Wilson's horse to do this errand. Um, so they were friends. Wilson was living right downtown and clearly was in and out of the museum. There's just no, you know, he, whether he was sat in the lectures, we have no idea. There's no way to tell. But most of the stuff that's in the lectures, uh, you know, the, the lectures really do follow the cabinets and, and, he knew, you know, there's all sorts, there are occasional anecdotes even in the lectures where, for example, the wood peewee, there's a, I just recently this month published a paper in the British Ornithologist Club's journal about the history of the Eastern wood peewee and how the Linnaeus's description was a taxonomic composite. And I it's designated neotype for that species. In there, I, uh, I give a quote from, from uh, Peel's lecture where, where Peel says, uh, that actually Mr. Wilson, you know, gave me this account and he realized that actually there's a second peewee and he called it the wood peewee because the peewee was the Phoebe at the time and Wilson called it the wood peewee to distinguish it from the regular peewee, which is the Phoebe. Um, so there are peppered throughout the lectures and through, there's also, uh, not, I'm sorry, not the lectures, peppered through the, uh, there's an essay, 1804-05, uh, called uh, A Walk Through the Philadelphia Museum, which was penned by, by Peel um, and also never published. And in the walk essay, which is, by the way, it's going to be published very soon on this website, uh, you know, he gives little anecdotes. Oh, Wilson told me this. Oh, like, Wilson told me that. So they were spending time communicating. There's no doubt. Oh, whether Wilson saw those? I don't know. No, I don't know. But yet, maybe we'll find out, right? Um, I want to thank you for that slide with um, Wilson and all the connections right at the end, and how we've lost certain stories of certain people because we tend to repeat the predominant story over and over again in two times. 
And the, the two people in, in your presentation that captured my attention were Sophie Yusba and Moses Williams. And so for folks that are looking for ways to connect and belong within the burning community, within the orange law people community, um, women and people of color, right? It seems their stories seem to be left out often. Is there a possibility to continue to tell those stories of those two people? Oh, yeah, based sure. On what or is it possible that those stories are lost because during that time those stories weren't captured? Um, yes and yes. Um, I would say that probably uh, I've written a lot of scholarly articles in my career so far, and probably the, the the writing that I'm the most proud of is Sophie Peel's Wikipedia page. Um, I added Sophie Peel to Wikipedia. I added Titian Warren to Wikipedia. I've been I've been revising the Wikipedia articles to reflect this information uh, uh, to make it as accessible as possible. There, uh, besides the Wikipedia page, currently there's no citable reference uh, except for the transcriptions of some of Peel's diaries that were published in the 80s. Um, there, you know, nobody's ever written an article about Sophie Peel and ornithology. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think an article like that would would uh, fit nicely in the Wilson Journal of Ornithology. Um, it takes time to tell the stories, and it takes time it takes time as a historian to get it to 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 feel confident. You know the Dunning Kruger effect, right? You know, it, real right off the bat, you feel a little overconfident, and as you go on, you're like, oh wait, this is a lot more complicated than I thought. Like, who is that guy? Like, oh man, how is this connected? And especially when there's no published sources to, to draw the lines between the people. Um, so it's taken me a really long time. I've been working on this for 13 years now. And, and I anticipate that I'm going to continue to work on this through the rest of my life. And, you know, the stories of Moses Williams, the story of, of Sophonis Bapil, um, are just begging to be told. And the, but so it, there's there's a lot of stories that are begging to be told, right? So um, the good thing is that we're starting to roll. Finally, I'm at the point where I'm starting to roll this this out. Um, it, what an honor and a great opportunity to be able to share all this with you today and to share the sort of a summary of what my research, some of the things that we've learned over the over the years. I've had some real great mentors too. Um, uh, John Van Horn at the Library of Company of Philadelphia, who's the director emeritus of that library. Uh, he is the, the lead editor of the America's Earliest Museums Project. He and I have been, for the last three years, just been constantly back and forth. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? How do we know that the, uh, the walk essay is dated 1805? How do we know this and that? Trying to get our facts straight. Um, and now we're finally at the point where we're about to roll out this website that's going to just knock people's socks off. Yeah. Um, and the some papers are going to follow that up. Um, and we'll tell the stories. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for uh, listening. We're going to take five minutes right now, and I will set a timer. Um, for you to do some reflection. Again, um, we're reflecting on uh, what Alexander Wilson means to you in your life, to you in your career, and to you as a member of the Wilson Ornithological Society. You can take those notes on your index cards. You do not have to share those with anyone. They're for you. And then you may look at those when you do your group discussions.